Well, when I first read the scripts and the, the outline of it, uh, the story of this family in a Melbourne suburb um, during the you know, late 30s and moving into the 40s of wartime, it was kind of romantic to me. It was a, it was a, I was close enough to recognise it without ever having been there, um, so I could identify with it. But it was a great kind of a thrill to be able to uh, interpret it and play it. And also, that period is so. Um, I mean, I saw all those movies of uh, you know the wartime movies and romantic sort of matinee things that you'd see and starting to see them on television and these old sort of actors and things and suddenly I was being one I thought you know and it was period piece so you're wearing all these great kind of clothes and hats and coats and it was just uh, it was a little kind of fantasy world for me. He had strong opinions about things he believed in things he had causes and um, and he kind of really identified with right as opposed to wrong. Like he didn't like injustice. He wanted to, he wanted to, to, to solve things. Twelve brigades of cavalry. Do you know what that would mean? I don't know much, son, but I know what 12,000 top-notch cavalry can do. Against tanks, dive bombers and machine guns? Look, Dad, I've seen you and Norm Baker almost in tears when you talk about the light horse having to shoot their horses at the end of the last war. Well, you think about 12,000 butchered horses and 12,000 butchered men, and that's just the start. There was a danger that he was going to be Mr. Goody Two-Shoes because he's always delivering babies, you know, with Lil next door, or he was always helping someone or seeing the right side of someone and stuff. But as, as you said, he also had a kind of a, a, a hot-headedness. Just giving you a word of advice, Mr. Duggan. Stay right away from Anna. Oh, what do you mean? If you even go near that shop again, I'll break your neck. Who the hell do you think you are? I think I'm the sort of fella that feels like vomiting every time he sees a character like you trying to spread his slime over a decent girl. Sullivan's did feel like a family on and off screen. Um, what did you do it was a great group of actors. I knew Stephen well, Tandy, who was course, Tom, you know and that. he was the year ahead of me at drama school. Huns, so I vaguely knew him. Oh, and um, Paul Cronin, Dad. Uh, I think I knew him from Matlock Police or something. I sort of met him in the Crawford Studios one time. But we all kind of bonded. We just It was a great mix of people. Sometimes you, producers and, and, and actors are lucky when a casting just goes click, and this one kind of just went click. With the main cast, which it was in the early days, was just that group of people. Everybody was ideal for the part they were playing, and their personalities were such that they kind of dovetailed into everybody else. So it was a really harmonious thing, and everybody loved doing it, and was just as enthusiastic. The youngest ones, who'd never done anything, to people who were quite, you know, experienced. Oh, Lorraine, well, I still call her mum, you know. <laughs> and we go, hi, mum, we'll see each other at the theatre or something. <clears throat> and she doesn't live very far from me, in, funnily enough. But, um, yeah, oh, hi, son, in Woolies or somewhere like that. Um, Lorraine was just gorgeous and always has been, always will be, I suppose. She's a very um, giving and easy person. She was probably in her late 30s, I don't know, but something like that. Um, so she used to age up, she had to age up to play this m mother. And she couldn't cook either. She just had no idea about how to do things. She could you know, make a salad, I think that was about it, and a sandwich. And she ate chocolates, she loved chocolates. She, if you couldn't find Lorraine on set, she was always in the set of the Sullivan's uh, shop, uh, eating the props, in, to the point where they, in fact we all did, but she was the worst. Um, they sprayed them with um, you know, insecticide and stuff, and lacquer. So that, because you could put your hands into those jars, it was fantastic. The whole shop was real. My house, my family home, where I used to walk to school from, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, was hmm, probably five minutes, not much more, away from the Sullivan shop and the Sullivan's home. So I could leave one home, my my parents' home, say goodbye to mum and dad, and then walk down the hill at seven o'clock or six o'clock in the morning, whenever it was, we'd start, and if we were on location, and walk in and go, hi mum, hi dad to, you know, Lorraine and, and Paul. The pub scenes all were, were initially, I don't think it, they continued it, but initially all the beer was real. And um, so you'd have, and, and smoke, it was always full of smoke. Um, and you'd get these regular extras coming in who, believe me, they didn't have to be told twice that they were needed on Thursday morning for a scene in the pub all day, because they'd shoot scenes consecutively. If it was a pub scene, then you shot all the pub scenes, then you'd move to, 
you know, the shop or you'd move to the bedroom or whatever. And um, yeah, real beer being poured. So by the end of the day, it was a real party down in that pub there. Good on your mate. I thought I'd have to drink with the flies. Ah. Empty glass. No, I can't. <laughs> Empty. The impact that the show had was amazing, really. I mean, we had no idea that what it was going to do. We were just, when we first started, it was just this new show. We're all in it. We never, I went down there for five weeks. Went down to Melbourne. I was living in Sydney. And in fact, most of us did. I said, it's a five week shoot. We're going to do this, this and this and this. We'll put you up at this hotel and whatever and had our suitcases and that was it. Well, I was there for six months. We couldn't stop filming because we had to put product into the can and we were only ever around about um, a couple of months behind going to air. So there was no room for, like you had to edit and post-production and stuff like that. You couldn't stop because you'd run out of product. The impact, once it did go to air and the public uh, started to recognise, I can remember walking down the street and really getting recognised by a total stranger for the first time. It might have happened once or twice with Division 4 or something like that. But once the Sullivan started, suddenly there'd be a group of people going, oh my God, pointing, and we were going, what, 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 you know, what's going on? And it was us, you know. And, um, and it kind of culminated, or reached its peak for me really, when poor old Anna, you know, got um, polio, my own wife, and died. And um, honestly, the flowers that came to the studio and the letters of condolence, and these were real, like, real letters and things, <laughs> you sort of got sad reading them, it was awful. I got sad because A, it was heartfelt, but B, you went, you poor deluded people. <laughs> you think I'm actually having, but that, you know, was sweet too, because they did believe that the, this family kind of existed. So in a way, it was a great kind of compliment. When you look back on something, you see it in historical perspective. And what it did, I think, it kind of gave a real figurehead uh, image to Australian content on TV and it gave Australian actors, it gave an audience, Australian actors to look at and identify with and go, we know them and we recognise what they do, A, as characters and B, as actors and we'll follow their career. It gave the industry a great kind of boost that Australian content was popular and that it was exportable. And that show, and it still is, it's like when all over the world, um, literally, Jordan and, and um, Indonesia and, and um, all the European countries to South Africa, I, it, it went everywhere. Um, and I guess it had the popularity of identity of a family and struggle. So um, if you look at it now and you see what they were doing, it, it's quite remarkable, I think. And it still holds up, you know, it's still got a great watchability and the characters are really well written and and you, you know it's got a heart it's got a real heart in it <sighs> it's so quiet terry's getting to me i keep thinking i should be hearing airplanes or or guns the rest of the world would have to get into a right old mess before it all got to melbourne <laughs>